That was unexpected. Booster 11 aces its static fire. Flight 4 soon? Starship recovery is coming. When will we see the super heavy catch? Elon Musk announces Starship V3. This one is a beast. And the Starship Mars colonization plan was unveiled. My name is Felix. Welcome to What About It. Let's dive right in. Starship updates. Wow, that was unexpected. An unannounced Starship update from Elon Musk himself happened. There is so much information there that we decided to dedicate the entire episode just to Starship, Starship V2 and V3, Raptor 3, Mars Colonization, Moonbase Alpha. Get yourself some popcorn, this is epic. First things first, the last campaign for Starship number 4 is unfolding at an astounding pace. It's been just shy of four weeks since we witnessed the last launch of the world's biggest rocket, and already the next one has breezed through its major milestones. The upper stage known as Ship 29 had already executed a spin prime even before Flight 3 and followed it up with two successful static fires shortly after the launch. Since then it has returned to the high bay. Last week we were scratching our heads over the removal of heat tiles from the tip of its nose cone. Our photographer John captured photos confirming that most of them were already reinstalled. However, there is a plot twist. On April 4th, the prototype was temporarily moved out from the high bay, revealing a rather unsettling sight. Ship 29 was stripped of dozens of its tiles, and in certain areas entire sections and even mounting clips were missing. Now before anyone hits the panic button, it's likely that the re-entry of Ship 28 provided SpaceX with data as to which areas of the ship need extra attention. It is all about surviving the re-entry. As a side note, you might be curious about the reason behind the rollout of Ship 29. Obviously it wasn't for a photo op. Surprisingly, the prototype needed to vacate the high bay to make room for Ship 30, which was being transferred to the second mega bay for its Raptor engine installation. So while Ship 29 gets a well-deserved break, let's pivot our attention to the Super Heavy designated for Flight 4, Booster 11. In our last update, we were on the edge of our seats, anticipating its rollout and the subsequent rush to static fire. True to expectations, that is precisely what happened. The prototype left the first mega bay on April 3rd and headed directly to the orbital launch mount. There it was hoisted onto the launch deck by Mechazilla an eternity later. This is a clear indication that despite the damage we spotted just after flight 3, the chopsticks are once again fully operational. Upon securing the prototype on the OLM, SpaceX teams were observed working on the deck, busy removing scaffolding. Finally, on April 5th, we saw a procedure that is already starting to feel like a routine. The road was closed and the tank farm came to life, allowing stage zero to slowly chill to cryogenic temperatures. This set the stage for the fueling process to begin, with pumps delivering liquid oxygen and liquid methane to the Super Heavy's propellant tanks. Following the tanking, the water deflector system was activated, showering the facility in a protective mist, and then all 33 Raptor V2 engines roared to life for a few seconds. Our cameras captured the scene nothing short of epic. Soon after, SpaceX shared some more spectacular footage from this test, confirming that it proceeded exactly as planned. At this point, I think we can all agree that those who argued that Starship would share the fate of the Soviet N1 by using so many engines were wrong. SpaceX is marching on and there are no indications that the Starship design won't do what SpaceX is planning for it. Moreover, it's noteworthy that this test occurred just three weeks and one day after the last launch. That's a huge improvement in turnaround time compared to the almost six weeks before Booster 10 could be properly tested post Flight 2. SpaceX is improving refurbishment times of the ground support equipment, rapid reusability will need some redesigning, but it is interesting to see how far down they can get the time between launches with the initial design of the launch mount and the tower. Following this milestone, scaffolding was quickly reassembled on the deck and by now Booster 11 is likely back in the first mega bay, undergoing final tweaks and potential upgrades. With the testing wrapped up, we weren't expecting much excitement at Starbase over the next week. You should never expect less at Starbase, you might be surprised by some extra epicness here and there. Seemingly out of nowhere, SpaceX released an over 40 minute update on the future of the Starship program delivered by Elon Musk himself. We've watched the whole thing and noted all the details to sum it up for you and give some insight. Musk has once again reiterated the objective for Flight 4. 
The mission will mirror the trajectory of Flight 3, but with the crucial distinction that this time the ship is expected to survive re-entry and splash down in the Indian Ocean. In one piece, of course, as technically during Flight 3 some of it did land. The Super Heavy booster will conduct a simulated landing, essentially maneuvering as if it were aiming to be caught by the Mechazilla arms, albeit just above the water's surface. Musk called it a virtual tower. The booster acts as if there were a tower out on the ocean. It's great that they are already testing this maneuver as they'll have to repeat it a dozen times before they'll attempt the real thing, right? Here comes the biggest plot twist from the presentation. Musk confirmed the swirling rumors that SpaceX intends to attempt catching the booster as early as during Flight 5. That is right, Booster 12 could be the pioneer booster to be retrieved via Mechazilla. I mentioned this during the IFT-3 flight stream. Landing a super heavy booster is very much like landing a Falcon 9 booster. Not much is different from an engineering standpoint, SpaceX is feeling confident. Musk estimates the probability of success to be between 80 and 90%. Despite the optimism, the stakes are undeniably high. One wrong move and the tower will need substantial repairs or, in the worst case, it'll have to be rebuilt. SpaceX also unveiled an updated animation of the catching maneuver and it definitely does look interesting. Just before the catch, the booster descends at a steep angle approaching the tower from the chopstick side. I don't think anyone was expecting that we'll see this attempt so early into Starship development. Recovering the ship, however, poses a more complex challenge. They need to do this more precisely. And by precise, they mean executing a powered descent to a specific location in the ocean. For instance, the planned splashdown for Flight 4, targeting a general area, doesn't count. Finally, during the third flight, SpaceX tested out the propellant transfer between the ship's fuel tanks. Elon said that next year we should expect to see a ship-to-ship -ship fuel transfer. This will be an incredibly crucial milestone in the development as without refueling, Starship can't reach the Moon or Mars with any meaningful payload. Musk also added that to reach the Moon or Mars with a 200-ton payload, Starship will require only 5 to 6 refueling maneuvers. This is substantially lower than NASA's estimate of 14 refueling flights needed to only get to the Moon with Artemis 3. This NASA number was was very likely estimated from current prototype efficiency. I always found it to be extremely high and it was even used to argue against SpaceX's Starship in the US Congress. To support the launch rate required for such a mission by the end of the next year, SpaceX will have four orbital launch integration towers. Elon Musk has mentioned the upcoming construction of a second tower at Boca Chica, a development that's becoming increasingly evident. He also hinted at two towers being planned for Cape Canaveral, with the one at LC-39A expected to be operational roughly a year from now. What intrigues me is Elon's mention of a second tower being constructed in Florida next year. Specifically, where such a tower would be. Some time ago, NASA confirmed that Launch Complex 49 is currently off the table. There was so much paperwork involved that SpaceX decided to drop it for now. I know I'm repeating myself, but if paperwork becomes a hurdle keeping the entire project from moving forward, that paperwork needs a reform. Currently, the company is interested in taking over Slick 37, but the environmental impact statement necessary for such a move will not be ready until summer 2025. Paperwork. If we could fuel a rocket with it, we'd be flying for free. A final decision is expected by October next year. This could be a suggestion that perhaps SpaceX wants to build two towers at LC-39A. However, for now, this remains highly speculative. What are your thoughts? Could the second tower in Florida be planned for Slick 37 or LC-39A? I'm eager to read your opinions in the comments. Now, before we continue with more Starship news, here's a word about insurance claims from TJ. Buckle up, it's the law. Thanks, Felix. Now, picture yourself driving to see a Starship launch, only to be hit by a distracted driver taking photos. <sighs> okay, post-accident procedures, consider seeking legal counsel, especially if you're seriously hurt. Your injury could be worth millions. You can check out Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury law firm, dedicated to securing your rifle compensation above lowball insurance claims. Just in the last couple of months, Morgan & Morgan saw verdicts of $12 million in Florida, $26 million in Philadelphia, and $6.8 million in New York, 25 times the highest insurance offer, and the fee is absolutely free unless you win. Don't overthink it, take action to protect your rights. Did you know that you can start a claim with America's largest injury law firm in just a click? 
it's so easy. You can start your claim now with Morgan & Morgan at ForThePeople.com slash WhatAboutIt, or click the link in our description. Thank you, TJ. We are not done with Starship. Let's check out the production site. The most dominant feature here is, without a doubt, the colossal Star Factory. A production line for Starship prototypes which to this point was mostly shrouded in secrecy. This changed thanks to this update, we finally got a look inside. We have a forward section of a booster as well as some sections that may be used to create test tanks. And we also saw a shot of a SpaceX engineer working on the aft section of a booster. You can clearly see a COPV tank as well as mounting points for the Outer Raptor boost engines. This year, this prototype factory will manufacture parts for at least six more complete ships and boosters. Speaking of, with this latest update, we've also received substantial details regarding the current and the next generation of Starship. Quo Vadis Starship Elon shared that the current version, Starship V1, as it was configured for the third flight, has the capacity to deliver 30 to 40 tons to orbit while maintaining full reusability. This is well below SpaceX's final goal. The V1 series will conclude with Ship 32 and Booster 14. Transitioning to V2, SpaceX aims to increase payload capacity to 100 tons, requiring numerous modifications to the vehicle. Starting with the upper stage, the Starship will grow. The V2 ship prototypes are expected to be 0.8 meters or 2.6 feet taller. This will extend the tanks a bit, allowing them to squeeze in even more propellant. This iteration will see the introduction of larger aft flaps and modified forward flaps, smaller in height but wider. These design tweaks aim to simplify re-entry by offering a bigger, controllable surface area. Looking closely at the provided renders, we can spot even more heat tiles, particularly at the front of the aft section, something we haven't seen before. For now, the six-engine configuration remains unchanged, with no plans to incorporate the additional three Raptor vacuum engines into the V2 ship. The prototype will obviously have many internal and external changes that aren't visible in the renders. For instance, recent pictures of what could be the payload bay for V2 revealed the PAS dispenser door positioned lower than on current models. Interestingly, it looks like the booster will also get a significant upgrade. Can you spot the most significant one? If you said the hot staging ring, then you are correct. SpaceX seems to be going the full Russian route with a design similar to what Soyuz or Proton rockets use for staging. Struts rather than a full ring with openings. This change will help save some mass while simultaneously giving the exhaust gases additional escape routes. With the new ring, the prototype will grow by 1.3 meters or 4.3 feet. The shared render also suggests that the grid fins will be moved a bit down and it seems that they are longer. Such a change could help them prevent being blasted by the ship's exhaust during separation and would again give them more control authority to work with. Surprisingly, the grid fins are also spaced 90 degrees apart. Right now, they are not evenly spaced. This could indicate a return to a previous design or possibly the adoption of just three grid fins, a concept Elon Musk has floated in the past. Moreover, all external stringers appear to be absent from the new design. It is important to note that SpaceX's own renderings tend to be really inaccurate, so take what you see with a grain of salt. The one change that is definitely there on purpose is the lack of shielding in the engine area. Raptor 3 also will not need a heat shield. We got a huge update regarding the beast that will be the Raptor 3 engine. There is a big chance that SpaceX might integrate Raptor 3 engines into V2 Starship, though it remains to be seen if this will occur right from the first prototypes on. The render of the Raptor 3 looks like it is missing something. However, Musk assured us that this is indeed what the third generation of this engine looks like. When Raptor 2 was introduced, people also doubted that SpaceX was able to simplify it this much, and yet here we are. We even got a video of what very likely is a static fire of Raptor 3, and just look at this flame, it is beautiful. The trick here is to integrate one thing into another, using tighter packaging. Most of the components from Raptor 2 are still there, they are just invisible as they are integrated into other parts. Comparing the two generations, the thrust at sea level improves by 50 tons of force, while the vacuum version gets 48 tons of force improvement. Those are huge improvements. The major difference between this generation of Raptor and the previous one is the addition of internal cooling channels to many of its components. Again, tighter packaging. Basically, the cryogenic fuel will circulate not only through the nozzle, but through the entire engine. Now, why would they need so much cooling? 
Apparently Raptor 3 can be used without any shielding on the vehicle or the engine itself. Consequently, the booster could shave a lot of mass. The cocktail shakers, as SpaceX internally calls the engine shielding, will be gone. The one downside of this move, however, is that without shielding and containment compartments, an engine explosion could prove fatal to the whole mission. The solution here is pretty straightforward. Just make an engine that never explodes. Simple, right? Now before I tell you about the ultimate Starship, Starship V3, we've looked into our channel metrics and there are over 2 million returning monthly viewers who have not subscribed yet. Help us improve the channel even further by double checking that you've hit that subscribe button so you don't miss our updates. And while you're at it, give us a like and become a Y supporter for exclusive SpaceX updates. You get access to daily Starbase photo galleries including satellite, aerial and ground photos of SpaceX's progress and countless other extra on top. And no matter how much you decide to give, everyone gets the same supporter content and access you decide what you want to give. For all those who watched IFT3 with us or somewhere else, I have something very special. Our IFT3 commemorative shirt. If you loved IFT3, this is something you want to have. It's in our shop right now. The shirt is tagged in the video as well. And the link to our Patreon page and our new website is in the description. Thanks to all those supporters who help us fund more crazy projects. We cannot thank you enough. You rock. Back to the ultimate starship. We might not see this generation for a few more years, yet the groundwork for its inception is already being laid out. It elongates the booster tank even more and introduces what's likely to be the fourth generation of the Raptor engine. Elon Gates. <laughs> this change would propel Super Heavy beyond the staggering threshold of 10,000 tons of thrust at liftoff. That is almost tripling the power of the Saturn V. Can you imagine that? Mind-boggling numbers. Moreover, the ship itself is projected to reach almost comical proportions, standing just 10 meters or 33 feet shy of the booster's height. With expanded tanks and the addition of three more engines, this version of the ship could embark on some crazy missions, possibly bringing tons of payload to geostationary orbit without needing to refuel. In an ideal scenario, this generation could result in the launch cost of Starship plummeting to between 2 and 3 million dollars. While that figure wouldn't directly translate to the purchase price for customers, it would significantly reduce the cost per kilogram to orbit. The cost of a refurbished Falcon 9 launch, which is estimated to be around 15 million, is largely due to the expense of fabricating a new second stage for the rocket. Musk claims that a Starship launch could cost less than the original Falcon 1 launch, which was around 9 million and it's certainly plausible. All of these upgrades will be done to achieve one main goal. Say it with me. Making life multiplanetary. To make life multiplanetary. Mars colonization has been a recurring theme in Elon Musk's presentations, but this time around we received more concrete details than ever before. For starters, establishing a self-sustaining colony on Mars, according to SpaceX's vision, would require transporting approximately 1 million people and 1 million tons of cargo to the Red Planet. Previously, there was talk that Starship could simply load up on more fuel and launch directly to Mars whenever it wishes. However, Elon now outlined a more realistic approach, adhering to the traditional launch window every 26 months when Earth and Mars align during the so-called transfer window. During such a window, we could witness up to 10 Starship launches daily, aiming to transport 250,000 tons of cargo to Mars in each launch window. 10 launches per day? How am I supposed to stream that? We'll need an elongated Felix as well. This ambitious schedule could enable the establishment of a self-sustaining Martian city within two decades. Achieving this would demand a staggering production rate of Starship, potentially reaching several vehicles per day. While SpaceX has released some optimistic projections, we must temper our expectations. Creating a thousand Starships is no easy task, and currently we're nowhere near this number. This may change in the future though. Musk brought a comparison to Tesla's 1.85 million vehicles produced last year. They said the same about EVs at some point. It is doable even if it hasn't been done before. When it comes to the first Mars missions, most individuals embarking on this monumental journey would likely not return to Earth. Do not panic, it doesn't mean they won't be able to return. Musk just says they won't want to return. 
Initially, the ships making the trip won't return, instead they'll be repurposed for materials to construct habitats and other infrastructure on Mars. A key milestone for sustaining life on the Red Planet involves producing methane, used as Starship's fuel on the Red Planet itself. The Sabatier process makes it possible. The process requires an abundance of CO2 and H2O, which Mars has in its atmosphere and in the ground, but also a significant amount of power, arguably the most challenging resource to secure once there. One slightly concerning point raised during the presentation is the revelation that SpaceX isn't currently working on any of the necessary infrastructure for living on and surviving on Mars. Their hope is that once the rocket is ready, other companies will want to join them in the mission. While this means that a Martian city is still a long way out, the upgrades and plans regarding Starship make me optimistic that we'll at least see a crewed Mars flyby by the 2030s. Here is to the future. That's it for today. Remember to smash that like button, subscribe for more awesome content. This is what fuels the algorithm and helps us immensely. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite Space Nerd store. And if you want to train your space IQ even further, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. Here are that. <laughs> the next one has a breeze, breezed, has breezed. Third. This set the stage for the fueling process to begin with pumps, delivering liquid oxygen and spitting on the camera.